students and get a fair deal in the Federation. Yesterday, oral arguments began in front of Alberta's appeal court on our constitutional challenge to the Trudeau government's No More Pipelines law, Bill C-69, also known as the Federal Environmental Assessment Act. In the last Alberta election, uh, I promised to Albertans that we would file this constitutional challenge to do everything within our power to fight back against what we believe is an illegal invasion of Alberta's exclusive authority under the Constitution to regulate the development of our own natural resources, a critical, hard-fought victory uh, uh, that was hardwired into the Canadian Constitution in 1982. We filed uh, our application for a judicial reference to the Alberta Appeal Court last September and I'm pleased that our lawyers are in court today together with uh, those from Saskatchewan and Ontario uh, and uh, Woodland Cree First Nation, the Indian Resource Council, uh, the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers, the Explore Explorers and Producers of Canada, the Canadian Energy Pipeline Association, the Independent Contractors and Business Association, the Alberta Enterprise Group, and uh, the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, uh, all together uh, to stand up for jobs and the economy here in Alberta, to stand up for our largest industry, Alberta's oil and gas industry, and to stand up for the Canadian Constitution and our province's exclusive authority to regulate our resources. So that was a promise we made to Albertans in the last election, promise made, promise kept. This is part of uh, Bill C-69 is part of a series of federal policies uh, that have attacked our vital economic interests and killed jobs and growth here in Alberta and other parts of Canada, like the cancellation of the Northern Gateway Pipeline uh, by the Trudeau government in 2015 uh, with the acquiescence of the then Alberta government, the killing of the Energy East project through new regulations that illegally sought to regulate pipe, pipelines on the basis of upstream emissions associated with them, clearly a violation of Section 92A of the Constitution. The plan to increase the uh, job-killing carbon tax to $170 uh, a tonne, putting our industry and our whole economy at an uncompetitive advantage, particularly in the, this trade-exposed industry uh, that competes with jurisdictions and producers that don't have taxes like that. The, uh, the, the new clean fuel standard and so many more regulations that keep layering cost on cost on cost, making it harder for our largest industry to succeed. And of course, the federal government folding on Keystone XL, both with the Obama administration's veto of it in uh, 2015, as well as the Biden administration's veto last month, uh, where the federal government didn't even pretend to put up a fight. I understand that uh, based on briefings from the Prime Minister's office, Mr. Trudeau does not even plan to raise specifically the uh, outrageous cancellation of Keystone XL by President Biden, a clear violation of the investor protection provisions of the North America Free Trade Agreement, and a slap in the face for this the United States' closest ally and trading partner. And that is why our government was elected with a mandate to fight back, to fight for a fair deal. That's what we did in keeping our commitment uh, to sue the federal government over its uh, retail carbon tax that pun punishes ordinary people for living normal lives, for driving to work, for heating their homes, for filling up their gas tanks. We did so through Alberta's constitutional reference to the Alberta Appeal Court uh, on the carbon tax, where we were supported, of course, by several fellow Canadian provinces and won an historic and critical victory, a four to one victory at Alberta Alberta's appeal court uh, in which the majority ruled that the federal carbon tax constituted quotes a constitutional Trojan horse unquotes violating our province's uh, juris jurisdiction. So I want to thank uh, 
nine of the Canadian provinces for having supported Alberta's leadership in fighting Bill C-69 when it was before the federal parliament in 2019. I want to thank the majority of Canadian senators from different party backgrounds for having uh, fundamentally rewritten the bill because it was so unbalanced, unreasonable, and unconstitutional. Unfortunately, the Trudeau government sent it back to the House of Commons and reimposed uh, the job-killing and uh, uh, constitutional violations of the original version. I want to thank the many interveners, including those from First Nations uh, and amongst job creators, who are supporting our constitutional challenge. Why is this, um, as I mentioned, we're also, on, in terms of um, fighting back, we've also filed, excuse me, not filed, but funded, I should say, uh, a constitutional challenge of the federal uh, tanker ban, uh, Bill C-48, uh, which uh, we're doing so through the Alberta Indigenous Legal Defense Fund, a, another commitment we made in the last election to support a stronger legal voice for pro-resource development First Nations. And uh, I want to thank our partners who are in our First Nations who are taking that to court uh, to say that it is unfair and it is wrong for the federal government to single out one single product, bitumen, produced in only one province, Alberta, for export off of one of our coasts, the north uh, west coast of Canada. Why is today's constitutional uh, challenge of the No More Pipelines law so important? Well, first of all, because it's about jobs and the economy. What it does is to create even more investor uncertainty. A growing body of economic research has uh, demonstrated the huge flight of capital from of job creating investment from Canada's economy. We saw that especially here in Alberta after 2015. And one of the reasons for it is red tape and investor uncertainty and endless delays in major projects like pipeline projects created by laws like this. Bill C-69, the No More Pipelines law, makes that even worse. It was hard enough to get projects to prove, to build big things, to create jobs, to attract investment under the previous law. And now, in, with a law that the federal, in a process that the federal government can stop at any time for any reason at the whim of federal ministers, they have effectively politicized the process and that creates investor uncertainty. And, uh, companies and investors have no idea how long the approvals process might last on a project. We saw that uh, last year. Uh, under the new Environmental Assessment Act, Bill C-69, with respect to the Frontier Tech Mine. They walked away from a prospective um, uh, $7 billion investment that would have created thousands of jobs exactly because of that uncertainty and because of uh, foreseeable delays. So, one reason why we are keeping our election commitment to be in court today, uh, f suing the federal government, over the No More Pipelines law is jobs and the economy. But an, another critical reason is that we are standing up for uh, our exclusive power under Canada's constitution to develop our resources. Back in 1981 and 82, when Premier Peter Lougheed uh, was fighting the National Energy Program, the federal government was also seeking to uh, patriate and, and change the, Canada's constitution. Our then Premier made it clear that Alberta would not sign its consent to a new constitution unless there was explicit protection for our power over our resources, the resources that belong to the women and men of Alberta. And so that is why we, uh, he secured Section 921A in Canada's constitution in 1982, the most important uh, legal and political victory for this province since the Natu Natural Resource Transfer Act of 1932 under Premier Brownlee. Section 92A, as our lawyers are pointing out at the Alberta Appeal Court today and week,
quotes, in each province, the legislature may exclusively make laws in relation to A, exploration for non-renewable natural resources in the province, and B, development, conservation, and management of non-renewable natural resources and forestry resources in the province, including laws in relation to the rate of primary production therefrom. So that is the law of the land. That is the supreme law of the land. That law has paramountcy over Bill C-69 or any other federal statute law. Uh, this was a condition precedent of Alberta signing the Constitution. Had it not been for this provision, Premier Lougheed, like Premier Levesque, would not have signed the Constitution in 1982. It would, have gone, it would not have had Alberta's consent. And so uh, we are in court today to defend this critical victory, this essential power uh, that underscores uh, Alberta's ownership of its resources, resources uh, the, the benefit of which we have shared with our fellow Canadians for decades. Bill C-69 seeks clearly, clearly to violate Section 921A of the Constitution because it gives the federal government the power to step in uh, and regulate right over top of us with respect to resource production. It is a regime which imposes a review in areas where there is no basis of federal jurisdiction. It takes projects without a required federal decision or tangible connection to a federal power, and it subjects them to an expensive review through a federal-only lens focused on federal priorities and federal choices, and then using these priorities to decide whether the project should proceed uh, irrespective of a meaningful independent federal duty over it. So uh, the arguments going on uh, here in Edmonton right now before the Alberta Appeal Court are of historic importance uh, and uh, we will look forward to of course the decision which we expect in a few months time uh, just as we continue to fight on every front for the economic future of this province and with that I'm happy as is Minister uh, Madhu to take questions. Thank you. Um, now we will go to the phones. If we can just ask you to limit yourself to one question, we'll get to as many as possible today. Operator, can you please put through our first caller? Emma Graney, Globe and Mail. Uh, yeah, g'day. Uh, this question is actually for the Premier. Um, obviously, we've got budget on Thursday. Um, Ray, you earlier on talked about a fiscal reckoning for Alberta. How much of that will we actually see on Thursday? Like, how bad is the uh, projected budget, sorry, deficit going to be, is it going to be more than 14 billion bucks? Um, and then on a related note, of course, oil prices are actually up and forecasts are not looking as horrible as they were. So how optimistic are you on that front in terms of resource revenues for Alberta? Cheers. Sure, thanks. Yeah, I, I thank you, Emma. I, I first used that reference of fiscal reckoning in my televised address to Albertans about the pandemic and the economic crisis in April of last year. And I was saying that uh, with the collapse in the global economy, the massive collapse in Alberta's revenues, and the huge expenditures that we have, the huge spending we have to do to protect uh, people in the economy that fund the healthcare system, that there would be a fiscal reckoning in the future. Uh, and, and that remains the case because, as you know, we inherited a deficit uh, in the range of uh, $7.5 billion from the previous government. Uh, we embarked on a, a prudent course to bring uh, balance back to Alberta's finances over the term of this government by getting our spending down to the average amongst Canadian provinces, which represented a 2.8 percent uh, reduction in program spending. Um, and then we got sideswiped by the triple black swan of the global recession, the uh, energy price collapse. So, uh, as you know, at the at the worst of it, in the second quarter of uh, last year, we were projecting a deficit uh, for the fiscal year uh, 20, uh, 2021 uh, in the range of $24, $25 billion. Um, uh, thankfully, uh, with um, some recovery, significant recovery in energy prices, uh, we have our revised projection has come down in our last quarterly report to about 14 billion dollars. You'll have to wait and see uh, on Thursday for our um, our final projection for the fiscal year that's about to end. But it'll be in that range. It'll be in that range. Uh, in terms of uh, and, and let me say our focus in this budget uh, is. Uh, investing in health care and jobs. It's protecting lives and livelihoods. 
uh, as, I, as much as I hate deficits, uh, now would be the worst time to uh, cut billions of additional dollars in spending when we need it in health care and we need it to help stimulate economic growth. This is exactly the time uh, that I think uh, uh, people across the political spectrum broadly agree that this is exactly the time that government needs to step up and make targeted investments. In our, in our case, investments in the pandemic uh, health response, health care generally, but also efforts to further diversify Alberta's economy and create jobs. So that is our focus during uh, this crisis. As we emerge from it, uh, you will see continued efforts by Alberta's government to operate more efficiently. And that will be a, a kind of sub-theme of Thursday's budget uh, as we continue gradually to strive to be as, uh, as efficient as other governments. So when we get out of the crisis and get back to some decent growth, we then have a, a, a chance of, of getting our, our, our fi a good chance of getting our fi a house financial house in order, pardon me, over the next uh, few years. But as, as the Minister Taze has said, that's really become not an immediate um, objective because that would not be realistic, uh, but rather a, a midterm goal, which we think is realistic. In terms of oil prices, uh, you're right, I was... Uh, I, I was very happy yesterday to see uh, w, Western Canada Select uh, uh, click past $50 and uh, WTI passed 65 We have seen some projections of uh, strong energy prices in the latter half of this year, I mean even stronger prices. And gosh knows, I hope that is true, but it would be irresponsible to plan for that. So you will see quite uh, conservative projections for commodity prices uh, in Thursday's budget. Um, and in fact, I think slightly below the, the uh, private sector forecasting average, uh, because we think that's the prudent thing to do. We, Alberta governments of different stripes are often, have often been criticized for trying to project their way out of deficit. We will not be making that mistake. Uh, we will be very cautious on projecting revenues and any incremental revenues that might come to Alberta through uh, unexpectedly high uh, energy prices uh, will be very helpful in reducing the deficit and um, uh, reducing the, uh, the projected increase in debt. Sorry, that was a very long answer. I apologize. Operator, can you please put through our next caller? Penny Trenton, Kicks FM. Uh, hi, good afternoon. Uh, my question is, well, I guess for uh, either who could answer this for me, and that's in terms of timeline. So, uh, Premier, you were mentioning that uh, they're in court as we speak now, um, kind of like the carbon tax uh, battle. We know that that eventually got appealed to the uh, federal court, and that's uh, we're still waiting for a result on that. So my question is, uh, how long do you expect that this is going to take to go through the legal system? Uh, and probably, as we saw with the carbon tax, we can, are you expecting an appeal? Uh, so, uh, I think we anticipate, Minister Madhu, about uh, typically about six months before the Alberta Appeal Court would uh, render its uh, judgment. That's about how much time they took on our carbon tax reference last year, uh, which we uh, ultimately won on a four to one vote in uh, February. So, February, about a year ago this week. Um, so, we're, we're expecting about a six month timeline on that. And uh, I'll invite Minister Madhu to give us an update on when we can expect a judgment from the Supreme Court of Canada on the carbon tax. I think it's supposed to be uh, in March. Finally, um, I would expect that this will end up at this, this challenge, constitutional challenge, of uh, Bill C-69, the No More Pipelines Law, will be appealed one way or another to the Supreme Court of Canada. Uh, should we not succeed, we would absolutely intend to appeal it. Uh, and I'm quite sure our, our allies would be there with us. And if, uh, if we're not successful, uh, then um, I, I anticipate the federal government would uh, would uh, seek to appeal it to the Supreme Court of Canada. Would you like to add anything to that? Yeah, uh, Premier, I think you have uh, um, essentially covered the, the time frame for this sort of appeals. So, as you know, Kenny, the argument began at the Alberta Court of Appeal on February the 22nd. It would go all the way till the 25th. And as the Premier rightly said, it would take about six months for the court to be able to deliver its judgment. We anticipate that at the conclusion of the appeal hearing, it will be resolved. Depending on the outcome of that proceeding, um, then obviously we would then make a determination as to whether or not uh, we need to appeal to the Supreme Court if we are not successful. Obviously, if we are successful, I think that would be a welcome development for Alberta. Operator, can you please put through our next caller? David Staples, Edmonton Journal. Hi, Mr. Premier. Uh, my question is on the uh, 
the coming budget. So when you were elected, it was on the promise of balancing the budget. And I'm just, you're talking about that as a midterm goal. So I'm wondering where you are in your thinking in that. But you talked about a new kind of promise, a new idea of um, not going above 30% um, debt to GDP ratio. Why do you have this new marker? Um, what, um, what's the purpose of it? And, um, you know, how can we, how can you make that stick if it's just legislation? Is it, uh, will it be uh, an effective thing to control spending? Sure. Well, thanks, Dave. Just, and just to refer back to my earlier answer to Emma, um, with the 20, look, <laughs> as a result of COVID, Alberta's government revenues collapsed by 25%, by one quarter. And while that has abated uh, in recent months because of uh, recovery in energy prices, we have still lost several lost several billion dollars in revenues that we were banking on. And and look, I, this wasn't because of wildly optimistic projections. We were right on the industry uh, average for projecting commodity prices and economic growth last year. It's because the whole world was sideswiped by the biggest economic collapse uh, in 90 years, and we had the Russian energy uh, price war. So I just want to underscore this. Uh, the, the day that Minister Taze delivered last year's budget, I believe could be, stand to be corrected on the exact figure, but I believe WTI was trading at over $71 a barrel. By uh, mid-April, early mid-April, we were selling WTI on the futures market at minus $20, a $90 turnaround uh, in the wrong direction. So this was a total collapse. I mean, we were looking through the first half of this fiscal year at at virtually zero uh, royalty revenue. At the same time, we've had to spend billions more on uh, health care, first and foremost, for pandemic response, but also billions more on economic recovery, surging capital spending to create jobs, uh, doing things like adding money and uh, uh, nearly a quarter of a billion dollars into the Alberta Enterprise Corporation to kickstart venture capital for di diversification in the innovation sector. Um, $800 million in, in modernizing Alberta's irrigation uh, system to uh, have a, future, a strong future for agriculture, so much more. So we've made strategic investments on the side of economic diversification, necessary spending on the side of health care and pandemic response. Add all of that up and it becomes um, effectively impossible without massive spending cuts. It, uh, right now to get back to balance or massive tax increases, either of which would hurt the economy when the economy needs help. And so that's why uh, we've had to just face reality, not fight against reality, not tilt at fiscal windmills, but just face up to it. The reality is with what we've been handed by COVID, uh, we cannot realistically balance the budget in the next two years. But I think we can make meaningful progress if we continue to hold the line on spending, which is what we've done. We don't get a lot of credit for this. We get attacked for various uh, difficult decisions. But n it's been a long time since an Alberta government had the willingness on some things to say no, so that we could say yes to a sustainable fiscal future. And so uh, you'll see that in the budget on Thursday, which is to say ongoing uh, spending restraint. Uh, that will be a, 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 an aspect of our uh, position in collective bargaining with the big government unions uh, throughout the course of this year. Um, and, uh, and so you ask then, why, did, why have we come up with the 30% debt to GDP uh, ratio? Well, in the spring summer, when we were kind of coping with this crazy, unpredicted new fiscal reality, we turned to a lot of uh, very wise outside advisors, including um, our Economic Recovery Council that we put in place back in, uh, in March, chaired by Dr. Jack Mintz. And, and he and that council recommended that, I mean, they saw the same stark reality we did. They saw that balance in this term was effectively impossible. And they said, but you've got to have some fisc hard fiscal targets that you will stick to and uh, on this, uh, I mean, they referenced Paul Martin in, two th in 1995, his famous statement, uh, come hell or high water, that the, the Cretchen government of the time would stick to its targets. For us, very important to uh, signal to Albertans and to investors, to bond markets, that we have very 
uh, solid targets or what you call fiscal anchors that will not move. That is to say, yes, we'll be borrowing. Yes, we'll be spending on health care and investing in the economy. But no, we will not do that recklessly. And so we, we fixed a, a target of 30% uh, debt to GDP ratio. We now have a tax supported debt in the range of, I think, $85 billion. Uh, so that gives us a, a bit of running room. Um, you'll see in the budget on Thursday, we, we think we can maintain that target. We think it's a credible target. We think it speaks to the concerns of bond rating agencies, hopefully to avoid uh, downgrades and to, and to enhance uh, confidence in our fiscal management. It also is, I'll, I'll close with this, it's an important signal for investors. Uh, this is something that my friends on the political left, I don't think adequately appreciate, but if, if you just let her rip on the fiscal side and just, uh, as we're being told by the opposition, just, just forget that fiscal discipline matters at all. If you just uh, have run massive, endless, huge uh, deficits, say north of $10 billion, um, what that says to investors that you're trying to attract to the province to create jobs is that there are major tax increases coming down the future and that the province's whole fiscal and economic policy is unpredictable because it will be burdened by big debt. So that's why the fiscal anchor is important to show that, yes, there's borrowing happening now, but we will, get, uh, uh, we will restore the, the health of the province's finances. We have time for three more questions. Operator, can you please put through our next caller? Rafi Bujikanian, CBC. Hi, Premier. On Saturday, a group of racists demonstrated in front of the legislature and walked around the capital city bearing tiki torches, which experts agree are symbols tied to white supremacy. Between Saturday and Monday, you or staffers who handle your Twitter account tweeted or retweeted on 18 different occasions at least. You didn't condemn Saturday's events until Monday afternoon after at least one journalist reached out to your office to obtain a statement. Why didn't you deem it a priority to condemn white supremacists sooner of your own volition? And when you did get around to it, why did you not post your text to Facebook as well? Well, uh, Rafi, first of all, the uh, I don't make a habit of attacking protests that are organized to attack me. Uh, I think that sometimes just adds fuel to the fire. And that was a protest of uh, people calling me a dictator and calling me a fascist and all sorts of names. And so, um, I, you know, I, as a general rule, uh, I, I don't think it's prudent to kind of feed into that uh, frenzy. And you know, uh, people, as I've said, that we have a freedom of speech and freedom of assembly, which people have uh, used. Now, I, I do believe there are Albertans out there who have, uh, who are opposed to our public health measures, measures that are designed to uh, protect uh, lives uh, and, and our health care system. I think there are people who oppose those views that, that uh, have no affiliation with or uh, uh, hate groups and are not in any way bigoted. And uh, I think we need to be mindful of that. But it on Monday, when we received a media inquiry, uh, we looked more closely at the event and found that they had used an image of the, um, apparently of the Charlottetown, uh, not Charlottetown, the Charlottesville, pardon me, uh, 2017 hate fest, which was clearly a white supremacist uh, event in the United States. Uh, and uh, on further investigation found that a number of people who had promoted the event uh, were uh, notoriously involved in spreading hatred uh, and that indeed people who attended, the, there's evidence that people who attended the event uh, had affiliations with uh, groups like so-called Proud uh, no, sorry, uh, Soldiers of Odin and the uh, Urban Infidels. Uh, where the heck these groups come from, I do not know. And they, um, and so we, uh, I'd, we received a media request on uh, Monday morning. We, we issued a statement on a Monday afternoon. Uh, so as I've always said, uh, Albertans, I, th I believe the overwhelming majority of Albertans uh, believe in human dignity, in the equality of all before the law, reject hatred, and organizations that promote it as well as their symbols. Uh, and uh, as I've said, if, if there were people uh, at that rally on Saturday who uh, were just there to protest uh, public health measures that they disagree and were unaware of some of these affiliations, then I believe they have a responsibility to condemn those groups, to condemn those symbols and disassociate themselves from those extremists and those forces of hatred. Operator, can you please put through our next caller? Graham Thompson, iPolitics. 
Well, hi, Premier. Thanks for taking the question. Um, quick question. It's a follow-up about the budget on Thursday. Um, you'll be jumping right into the budget. There's no sort of start of a new session, and there's no throne speech. Why not have a throne speech to you know, outline your feelings of what's going on right now and actually set up your government's agenda for the coming session in the coming year? A fair question, Graham, and thank you for it. So the answer is uh, a couple of points. Firstly, um, just logistically, the, the ceremonial aspects of doing a, a throne speech are very complex because of COVID restrictions. So as you know, we have to have a very limited uh, presence of members in the House. Uh, and so most of the fanfare uh, normally associated with the throne speech would be uh, extremely difficult to do logistically uh, in a COVID safe way. Secondly, um, many of the bills that, as you know, our legislative agenda was uh, sideswiped, uh, like so many other things, by the pandemic. So a number of the bills that uh, the Lieutenant Governor uh, announced in last year's throne speech did not get tabled or moved through the legislature because we had uh, uh, periods when, when uh, house sittings were interrupted uh, uh, due to uh, for, largely due to COVID. So in other words, a, a, a number of the bills that we'll be introducing uh, in this spring session were actually already announced in a throne speech. So we didn't have a normal legislative year in that respect. Um, and, and thirdly, uh, Graham, I, I, I think, you know, um, we are hopefully in the last quarter of this uh, pandemic and i think people's mind minds pardon me are just focused uh, overwhelmingly on on getting through the pandemic um, on the immediate challenges that we face and i think there will be a a natural time for uh, all of us uh, to uh, post pandemic uh, in a sense, hit hit the reset button. So that's why we anticipate doing a throne speech in the fall. Uh, I, I, I please God, we will have had adequate doses of vaccines, and um, with weather and and other factors, we'll be well past the worst of the pandemic, and we can move forward on a whole lot of other issues that are not pandemic related. But I just think right now, for both logistical reasons and just the general mood of the public, is not the right time to be talking about a whole lot of other issues that are not pandemic related. Operator, can you please put through our final caller? Audrey Nouveau, Radio Canada. Hi, Premier. Um, I have a question in English and in French for you today. Concerning the court challenge, your court challenge of Bill C-69, why are you doing a press conference today? We don't have a decision yet, and usually you shy away from publicly commenting when the matters are before court, like they are right now. So what do you hope to achieve today? Uh, tout d'abord, ce pas une question criminelle, c'est une question uh, uh, constitutionnelle. Et également, c'est une question politique. Évidemment, c'est un engagement électoral que nous avons fait dans les dernières élections albertaines. Et alors, je veux souligner pour les Albertains que le, le gouvernement garde notre promesse à cet égard avec cette, euh, cette défi envers le gouvernement fédéral. C'est également, c'est essentiel parce que ça touche à notre économie, aux emplois en Alberta. Évidemment, notre économie a été le plus euh, affectée le, euh, 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 le plus euh, profondément dans la récession de COVID-19 parce que notre économie était déjà fa faible auparavant, en partie, en partie à cause des politiques euh, fédérales comme le projet de loi C-69. Alors, pour moi, c'est une question à défendre les intérêts économique essentielle de, ce, de cette province et notre, nos pouvoirs garantis dans la Constitution du Canada. René Lévesque a refusé à signer la Constitution en 82 et Peter Lougheed a signé la Constitution seulement parce que le fédéral a ajouté une reconnaissance de pouvoir exclusive des provinces à gérer leurs propres ressources et ça c'est les raisons pour lesquelles nous sommes en cours aujourd'hui dans la cour aujourd'hui pour défendre ce pouvoir essentiel constitutionnel c'est une promesse que nous avons fait c'est une promesse que nous gardons aujourd'hui thank you very much